Scripture tied in. We've made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, not others. And the Scripture tied in with that is, let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 3.40. I want us to turn in our recovery Bibles to Psalms 32. This is the fourth week of step four. Page 700. Page 700. Page Hold your finger there. I want to share something with you before we go into this. <coughs> okay. Those too. You know, I, I think it is like, oof. Yeah. All right, so just listen up now before we go into Psalm 32. The basic forms of selfishness in all of us are resentments, fear, pride, envy, dishonesty, greed, and moral sexual misconduct, lust. All of these will block God's spirit and make it hard for us to know his will or to feel his presence. As these blocks are identified, we can be freed from the burden of trying to look good. The goal is to become more real and honest with people who are in relationship with us. To be searching and fearless, we must look at ourselves morally because God is just and moral. This is difficult when we have been consumed by our sin nature or our addiction in Maya and self-will. Fear must be put aside and humility will grow a little as we are willing to document our flaws and misbehaviors. We examine the people, institutions, situations, and events of our lives that have caused us pain and resentment and we assess our part in them. We do not excuse others for their wrongs, but we see our side of the street. For the first time, we take responsibility for how we have been resentful and fearful, judgmental and critical, negative and isolating. Usually, these responses originate from perceived or real threats to our self-esteem, pride, ambition, material or emotional security, and relationships both acceptable and hidden. The good news about this work is that we gain an honest picture of ourselves, possibly for the first time. If we weren't so miserable and desperate for a new life, we wouldn't be this gut level honest. We begin to see patterns of behavior that have caused us trouble time and time again. If fear is a huge pattern for us, we must turn this over to God. If resentment is our reaction to being hurt or snubbed, we must learn to pray for the person that hurts us. Any resentment, whether justified or unjustified, allows that person to control us, even if he or she has forgotten the incident. Obviously, there is less room for God in our lives if we are controlled by resentment and fears. Letting go of resentments and fears by working the first three steps on them will banish our irritable, discontented attitudes. Serenity and peace of mind can flow into our lives. Internal changes will become more apparent to others. After a thorough searching and fearless inventory, we can gain a clear understanding of how basing our lives on self has kept us from freely walking close to God. It becomes clear that we have anesthetized, anesthesized out of the emotional and mental pain of our lives 
with our addictive substances and behaviors, further cutting us off from God. This first inventory is the beginning of a lifelong practice of self-examination that leads us out of addiction and into a relationship with God. I'm going to name that man. So what blocks us from God? Our sin, our attitude, our bitterness, our resentments. All these things block our relationship with God. Is everybody in Psalm 32? Yep. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away. Now, what is he talking about? This is King David. King David was concealing what he did with Bathsheba and her husband. Remember? What did, they do? What did he do? He had sex with his, his best friend, right? And then what did he do? He had him killed. Yeah. All right? So what was he doing? He was trying to conceal that, right? And while you, when we try to conceal our sins and our misdeeds, what does it do? It's like cancer inside of our souls. We're miserable, discontented, fearful, all these things. So we understand that King David knew why it was happening. Look what it says. When I refused to confess my sins, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. So what happens? The Lord puts his hand on us. He doesn't give us the freedom. He makes us what? Burdened with the heaviness of our sins. Until what? Look what it says. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. Look what he says. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. Amen. All my guilt is gone. How about a big amen there? Amen. Now we have to understand that stuff we keep in secret grows inside of us and causes us what? Pain and suffering and resentment until we what? Let it out. Now look what it says. Look at what he says in verse 6. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may not drown in the flood waters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. You know when you want to, for a horse, what's he trying to say here? For a horse, it needs to be what? In order for it to turn and do the right thing, we have to cause it pain. So it puts the bit in the horse's mouth. If it wants it to take a right, it pulls on it, causes the horse pain, and it turns. God's saying, I want you to not have to what? Get corrected by me with pain, that I have to send pain into your life. I'd rather just lead you by my eye which is the Word of God, saying, look, God says this is wrong, so let me stop doing it, repent of it, and confess of it, so you, I don't have to feel the judgment from God. Can I get an amen here? Yeah. That's what he's telling us here. But we're so stubborn that we have to what? We don't usually confess till we're in a, in a lot of pain and suffering. But he doesn't want it to be that way. So once you learn this principle, you go right to your knees and confess it to God, and pray to the Lord about it. Amen? Amen? And that's what step four helps us with our defects. Now look what it says. Look 10. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey Him. You see, when we obey the Word of God, He puts His hedge of protection around us. He puts his, his covering of grace and mercy over us, and He protects us from ourselves. 
Shout for the joy, all you whose hearts are pure. How do you purify your heart? By confessing and repenting. And this is the process of the step work that helps us to do that. Again, get an amen. amen. All right, now go to Psalm 139. Let's see if step four is biblical. Let's check this out. How's that? Why is it important when we do this inventory to invite God into it? 775. Page 775. Why is it important to invite God into it? Because we can lighten the load here and say, well, you know, I'm not that bad. He will, bring to, he will bring your character defects to mind, and he will put people in your life to show you what they are. But you have to be ready to receive that. Because God works through people, places, and things. If you are in recovery, you'll be able, ready to accept what comes in front of you or if people are letting you know something in your character that's flawed. You can thank them because they see something in you that you can't see because sin is so blinding. Look at verse 23. King David asking the Lord, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. So what's Paul, he's doing a step for you. What's he saying? Search me. When you ask God to search you, right, and know your heart, because he knows our heart better than we do, Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. He will show you the things in your character that offend God. So when you get into step four and do the searching and fearless formal inventory, God will show you what's wrong with you, not what's wrong with other people. Listen, everybody's got flaws in their character. There's something wrong with everybody. Anybody born into this world has character defects because we're born into what? Sin. Yeah. We're all addicted to sin. This is something that we're in recovery from. When we get saved and born again, we are recovering from sin. So abstinence is not recovery. Not doing something is not recovering. That's just not doing it. Recovering is what? Getting to the root of it, correcting it, and changing it. Can I get an amen here? It's easy to not do something. The outward things are the easiest things to give up. Like, I'm not going to drink anymore. Or I'm not going to... Once you give that up, the stuff inside of us comes out. The stuff that we can't get rid of. That only Jesus can get rid of. We can put this stuff down. The physical stuff. But that's really not the problem. That's just the cover for the problem that's underneath all that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't... I'm, not, I'm just using drinking. It could be anything. Shopping, <laughs> eating, whatever it might be to make you feel better from your sins. That's what it does. We try to bury our sins with all flesh, fleshly things. Only at the end of the day you're stuck with yourself and you know that that didn't fix anything. So if you really want to get to the root of pro the problem, you have to do a fearless and searching moral inventory of you. That sounds scary, right? But it's the most freeing thing you can do. To just be humble enough to realize I'm not all that in a bag of chips. And I, I can be real. You know what, how beautiful it is for you just to be able to be yourself and not have to hold up to a standard for anybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That this is me. Take me as I am. That's right. When I go up to the pulpit, and I say I'm the first one. So nobody's thinking that I'm better than anybody or expecting me to be. Because I'm not. Amen. I got to go to work with the same type of thing. I got to get on the road with everybody the same way. Mm -hmm. And I got to struggle. As a matter of fact, I struggle more than you. Because they always try to take the leaders out. Mm -hmm. So I know what it's like and I understand the struggle. <coughs> but he was in me is greater than he was in the world. <coughs> I got Jesus in me now mm -hmm. that I can say no. And when I do say yes, I can go back to this and find out why I said yes to it. Yes. And go deeper. Say, why did I fall into it? Why am I keep doing that? What is wrong with me to keep doing something that I should not be doing? Why, why can't I go to Jesus why do I keep going to the drink, or the shopping, or the food? Why can I go to the ultimate healer, Jesus, and let him put that to death? How do you kill something? 
Stop it. Stop it. You kill something by stabbing it. Now, in the beginning, when you stab something, you start to, before it dies, it, it gets really what? Really difficult because it, your body starts craving it. You start to withdraw from it, whatever it might be. Now, withdrawal can be from anything. It could be from shopping. It could be from eating. It could be from drinking. It could be from drugs. It could be from what? Gossip. It could be from anything. Anything that make us take us outside of ourselves. But once we stay, say no to it and start to trust Jesus, he's trying to kill our flesh, not keep it alive. You see, once you kill your flesh, you keep running to the Messiah. Because he's the one that keeps us alive in the spirit. When you're born again in the spirit, you have to kill your flesh. And whatever you feed is going to win. Mm -hmm. If you feed your flesh, that's going to take over. And if you feed your spirit, it's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And your flesh is going to get weaker and weaker and weaker. This is not osmosis. You have to go to the you have to run to the word of God when these urges come to divert it so you don't go to it. Okay. You have to replace it with something good. You have to replace a bad habit with something good because if you don't replace it, it's going to come back with a vengeance. The Bible says when an evil spirit leaves you, it goes in the desert, mm -hmm. finds no rest. It comes back, finds you all swept and in order, all cleaned up. Then it finds seven more of his friends and comes back into you. You're worse off than before. If you don't fill it with spiritual things. Amen. See? Okay. You can put it away, but if you don't replace it with something, that it's coming back with a vengeance. And it comes back and it's very subtle. Yep. Very subtle. One day you might stop praying, you might not read your Bible, and everything's fine. Everything's fine. You start what? Missing church, fellowship with other believers, right? Then you start to get what? The attitude starts coming back. You start to get indifferent. Mm -hmm. I'm not like the people in church. They're a bunch of nuts. I'm not, I don't know what they're talking. We start to find fault with everything. Yeah. Then we start finding fault with everything. We say, oh, this isn't worth it, and then we go back into the vice again. We set ourselves up for failure. You see? This is what happens. That's why we have to grow spiritually. Our church is all about spiritual growth. Amen. And crucifying our flesh. That's why we don't have smoke shows and things to keep our flesh alive when you come to church. We have what? Bible. The Bible kills your flesh. That's why sometimes when I preach a message to the pulpit, it's hitting you between the eyes and you're getting all convicted from it. That's not me. That's God convicting you, telling you that that's not right. That you need to make some changes in your life. Can I get an amen here? Amen. Which is good for you. Unfortunately, I get stuck with the job of having to convict people. But, it's the truth that will set you free. Amen. First, it, first, of course, crucifixion. What do you think crucifixion is like? It's a Ooh. slow, painful death. Crucifixion of the flesh is a slow, painful death. And most people are not willing to die to it. So, they end up going back and back. Just ready to come up to the mountaintop and go right back down again because they don't want to go through the pain. When the pain comes, they go to the vice instead of Jesus. That's what happens. We're all going to have to give an account for that. Now, now we're going to read step four. Go with me to Revelations chapter 20. Is everybody with me so far here? Yeah. Yeah. Now, what, a better, what not a better time now than the new year yeah. to start doing things God's way? Don't you think he knows us better than we do? He's the one who made us. How many times do I say, the owner's manual, the one who made the product, Knows how to put it together better than we do. Yeah. Step four was on 1667. 666 on the other side. Yeah. We've got a lot to cover here. But when we do these steps, they're in order. That's why the first three steps get us ready to do this step. God's mercy. God's mercy. Exactly. How many of us need a lot of mercy? 
I'm such a wretch. I am. I am a wretch in my flesh. I am such a wretch. And I might not show it on the outside, but inside, I know what I'm thinking, right? I know it. Sometimes it comes out, but it's the stuff that we conceal, that we really know who we really are when something happens, when we get offended, when we get angry, when we get bitter towards somebody, when we get silent treatment, you don't say anything to anybody, but you can't hide it because it comes out, it, it, it emanates from you when you're like that. Negativity, right? Anger, bitterness. You can't get that expression off your face. That's why it's better than what? Go confess it. Go in the chapel. Lord, please. <laughs> Give me a couple of slaps in the face like you're smiling. That's what I need. I'm blaming people, places, or things again for my behaviors. And I'm getting offended when you show me something in me. If you get offended by somebody showing something in your character, you're not in recovery. You're not in recovery. You're in a relapse. You're just waiting to go backwards again. Instead of saying, thank you, you're showing me something I couldn't see in myself. But the truth hurts. That's the problem. But if you want to recover, you have to get the truth. Truth is truth about you. Not about someone else. The mirror. All right, let's read God's mercy. Is everybody there? Yeah. Revelation chapter 20, we're on page, um, step 4, 1667. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. <clears throat> we may wish we could avoid taking a moral inventory. It's normal to want to hide from personal examination. But in our heart, we probably sense that a day will come when we'll have to face the truth about ourselves and our life. The Bible tells us there's a day coming when an inventory will be made of every life. No one will be able to hide. In John's vision, he saw a great white throne and one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelations 20, 11, 12, 15. It is best to do our own earthly moral inventory now so we can be ready for the one to come. Anyone whose name is in the book of life will be saved including all whose sins have been atoned for by the death of Jesus. Those who refuse God's offer of mercy are left to be judged on the basis of their own deeds recorded in the books. No one will pass that test. Perhaps now is a good time to make sure that our name is in the right book. <laughs> Knowing that our sins are covered with God's forgiveness can help us examine our life fearlessly and honestly. I'll put a big amen there. Amen. All right, let's read Revelation chapter 20. Let's go right to verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Wow. So, the Bible's telling us we're going to get judged for everything we've done after salvation. Everything. 
Everything we did, good and bad, after salvation, will be judged when the books are opened. So wouldn't it be a good time to do it now before we have to go before him with it? It would be. Trust me. It's better to do it now than to wait till that day comes. Now, let's look at verse 21. There's some hope here. The new Jerusalem. I love this verse. Look at this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. <clears throat> I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. Thank you, Jesus. Just think about that day when that comes. How about a big amen there? Amen. All right, now in verse 20, verse 11, on the bottom of that page. See it? 11 to 15. At the climatic white throne judgment, those who reject God will face eternal consequences. Believers in Christ, however, will be shown amazing grace. Most of us expect our judgment to be based upon whether or not we are guilty. At this judgment, though, everyone is guilty. The people who have believed in Christ will be forgiven. Those who have chosen to go their own way are headed to a place of eternal torment. No matter who we are or how terrible our past, we can have our name written in the book of life. We cannot earn a place in that book we can only receive it as a gift. By admitting our failures and trusting our life to God and Jesus Christ and building a new life, according to God's will, we become a member of God's family. I brought an amen there. Amen. All right, we're going to read some questions. Thank you for letting me share that.